Also, watch at the end uh, of this video, at the very end after I do my little sign out, uh, there's going to be a special announcement concerning some potential swag to do with uh, Star Frontiers, with Star Frontiers Gamer, with the uh, Star Frontiers Men Volume 2 Reborn. Uh, and But that'll be at the very end after the sign out. So don't forget to uh, watch for that at the very end. Hello, this is Tom, a.k.a. Jereon here for Tabletop Tap Room. And I'm doing a little bit of a review video of somebody else's video. Uh, down the rabbit hole, another YouTuber um, who is a... Uh, Everyone. Uh, welcome to another Down the Rabbit Hole video. We're doing Down the Rabbit this. Hole. All right. So uh, I love this guy. Um, Kevin is in Canada, and he produces Star Frontiers can uh, content from Canada. And uh, my only complaint about Kevin is he doesn't produce enough Star Frontiers content. But, so uh, you know... <clears throat> He's an all right guy, and I like his videos. And so this this video he just he just released kind of spurred this on. I want to uh, make a few comments on it, and then expand on the whole Lakos um, Lakos War theme, the Planet of Laco, uh, for you guys. Star Frontiers video here, and where are we? We are on my version of Laco the sandy, strewn desert planet that I had in my campaign. It was an interesting experience, but it was also, while something I really tried to invest a lot of science into and... Now, I, I like what he does, what he did. I mean, and, and apparently he did this as a kid, investing all these ideas of science into his game. And uh, I like a lot of what he did with this. It's really good material. Believability, it was ultimately brought down by the most obvious piece of logic from my players. So I just thought I'd give you <laughs> So <laughs> I waited through this whole video to see what it was his players did that totally crashed his game. Because I was thinking like they found some logical inconsistency in the environment because what he's proposing here is what a lot of us have done with Laco, that it's a uh, sandy desert world. Um, so I was waiting with bated breath, but what it was, was it was just classic, no adventure survives contact with the players. <laughs> so, um, you know, it was not so much that uh, all of his logic that he dumped into the, uh, into the game uh, was faulty. Uh, it was that, you know, the players just were like, oh, well, why don't we just do this? And it was the game master had not thought of that. Uh, and so yeah, it was one of those situations. You, uh, a little bird's eye view, almost literally in this case, of Laco, my little campaign that I had here. I thought to myself, now, Laco is one of the planets, it's, it's mentioned, uh, it orbits the star Dixon star, and it is known because on pages 56 and 57 of Zebulon's Guide to Frontier Space, they talk about the corporate wars, how this was... Okay. <clears throat> now, he's brought up Zebulon's Guide. So while we're here, let's just mention the fact that um, the pages he's referring to in Zebulon's Guide, um, I believe, are the timeline... Uh, no, no, it's the Ice Wars section for the corporate wars. Um, but close to that is the Astro what I call the astrographic catalog. It's not called that in any of the rule books. But it's what I call it because, uh, you know, you got the star and the planet and then the listing telling you, you know, how long the day is, what the gravity is, how many moons, how many satellites like major space stations, the economy, you know, primary colonizers, you know, so on and so forth. Um, the astrographic catalog in Alpha Dawn is different than the astrographic catalog in Zebulon's Guide, where Laco is concerned. In Alpha Dawn, it lists that the population le level of Laco is an outpost. In Zebulon's Guide, it lists that it is medium. So there has been a change. And so I go ahead and embrace both. Yes, both are correct. The outpost level predates the first Sathar War. 
Uh, and then events in the South Our War contribute to that rise in population because we learn primarily through um, uh, Zeb's guide that uh, refugees escaped from Pale to uh, from uh, Truane Star, planet Pale, to uh, Dixon Star and the planet Laco. So you have refugees coming here. Uh, the Sathar follow and land on the planet. And, um, you know, so they land troops on the planet. And then after this, the uh, Morgan, Avril Morgan, and the second common muster vanquish the, um, the Sathar. Well, while they're landing troops on Dixon Star, he's vanquishing the fleet that arrives at Cassidy. He then hot foots it to um, Prangular. And um, you have the, at, at that point, you have the Battle of Morgane's World War, uh, Admiral Morgane loses his life. They rename the world in his honor for his victory there that essentially saves the frontier. But there are troops on Laco, and we have other uh, canon data that says, you know, the World Guard has never lost the battle. Well, who were they fighting in the past 500 years of history on Clarion? Uh, you know, so... Um, the Royal Guard being an organized army, uh, organized force, was one of the first forces deployed to um, to interdict the Sathar on Laco, and then eventually they moved, you know, all the raised battalions that PG, uh, PGC helped raise, you know, this 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 proto force that would eventually become ground fleet. Uh, and, and moved on to Pale and liberated Pale from the Sathar that were landed there to conquer the world Pale. So, um, you know, you have the uh, Royal Guard uh, arrives on Laco. And, and, you know, so this planet's gone through a lot of evolution um, between one astrographic catalog and the other. And so what you get in Zebs really represents a later date in the history. That's how I handle that. It's starting to become a thing, especially between Sathar War One and Sathar War Two. Anybody who's not deep into the lore of Star Frontiers may not know that, but I thought to myself, I'm going to set my campaign between Sathar War One and Sathar War Two. I just thought that would make the most interesting, compelling. Time. Yeah, uh, I I totally endorse that. You know, uh, putting a campaign between the two Sathar Wars. Uh, it's an age of adventure, a lot going on. I like that. Um, you know, you you can do a later campaign, but I I just like it in that in that time period, and I just feel like that's a really good time period in the timeline to use. Timeline, and so Laco's War was uh, happening, and I thought, okay, but I don't want it to become its own separate thing. I was kind of fleshing out what my campaign was going to be, and I didn't really know very well. So I just thought, okay, what to me is Laco's War? It obviously takes place on the planet Laco, and there's no details really given about it. I mean, the amount of hours of the day in that kind of Now, there is a clue why you would have this war, and um, he doesn't use that. It's the presence of the Tetrarch Pyramids on Laco that uh, I feel is the the catalyst for the Lakos War, that uh, when it was still an outpost, nobody had found the pyramids yet, but now you've got these aliens invading and landing. Um, and I, I feel like the Sathar are, are like really interested in the Tetrarch pyramids. The Tetrarch pyramids are 10,500 years old. Um, that's when the last remnants of their society died out. And uh, so this is a forerunner, precursor civilization of advanced aliens. And I kind of feel like the prize that their ruins represent is, a, is an adequate um, cause for the war. And that you have PGC and Streel are uh, competing for control of the planet. PGC has built a whole compound and... and automated factories, um, you know, so, you know, that, and that PGC city will have a starport that's PGC only 
only PGC ships can land there unless there's an emergency. Um, but even then, PGC security is going to be all over your ship if you if you declare <laughs> and you land there. So, um, you know, the, yeah, it, it's uh, I, I use the Tetrarchs as part of because you have a war going on for 10 years with a serious amount of casualties, something that compares well to the American Civil War, which was a horrific war with a lot of casualties. And these are mercenaries. These are mercenaries being brought in by corporations to fight this war. So it doesn't make a lot of sense, but if it's, no, it's just prideful CEOs going, we're going to get control of those, of those ancient ruins and whatever prize they represent, that's what we're after, then maybe I, I would accept that reasoning. Now, let me just jump this ahead. Kind of very remotely broadly i took what was in the book because again zebulon's guide i had thought hey this is volume one there's going to be more volumes clearly i need to set the stage for what Lacko's war is and it does mention how it went on for a long time and it dealt with a lot of battles it was between the pan galactic corporation which is basically the now i like this um this uh symbol for pan galactic corporation he's worked up this differs from uh, what's in the book. Now, this is the Alpha Dawn book, and this is the first look at we get at uh, PGC personnel. You see this ship, which is using some form of countergrav that doesn't exist in the setting. Uh, it's called the PG, uh, PGT, Pangalactic Transport 2. Uh, so this is the first look, and uh, I noticed that these guys have some sort of a uniform I love the rolled shoulders, uh, and then there's like this half moon patch, half semicircle patch uh, on their uh, left uh, breast pocket. So that's the first look we get at uh, PGC personnel. But then in Zeb's guide, we get this uh, new pangalactic patch, which uses pyramids in the, in the, um, to replace the A's in Pangalactic. So this is um, showing, you know, that Pangalactic, had, at, at, after they were the conquering heroes, the Lakos War, that uh, they changed their company symbol to represent the fact that, yeah, we got control of them pyramids. So, uh, and then you see Streel Corporation uh, name here. So um, his is different, but I kind of like it. Big, uh, you know, it, it looks Amazon like something I would incorporate. Microsoft slash Apple slash Google of the Star Frontiers world. And, and he's making a good point here. Pan Galactic's like uh, Uble, uh, 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 Google, Apple, you know, uh, Microsoft, Apple, all rolled into one so mega monster corporation. Does what it's want, what it wants. It's amoral. Um, you know, can run people over if it feels like. <clears throat> Pit it up against rival company Streel, which is again another Amazon, Google, you know, Microsoft, etc. So, <clears throat> you know, he. You know, he, he's working his way through this. Now, I'm not going to review the whole video. I uh, just want to hit some excerpts. Let's jump ahead to um, where he talked about some cool stuff. Pictures that would exist on there. I had in my mind an idea of, like, the lone rider going out across the sand dunes on some kind of a beast of burden. And I thought to myself, kind of like when I talked about the Star Wars Dubek along those lines, but I wanted it to be very alien and different. And I came up with, in my head, somebody sitting on some very large, flat, pancake-like creature. And I remember thinking to myself, hey, um, whenever you see footage of Sidewinder uh, snakes going across the desert, you know, they do that, that swirly kind of movement with their body, and that's how they travel across. Imagine taking two of those side by side, that kind of movement, that propulsion system. And I thought, well, what's something that would move in that manner? And for whatever reason, I thought of manta rays. I thought, can you imagine a really large manta ray, a little more like lumpy, a little more rounded instead of the flat aquatic creature? Something that's more like it takes its wings and it forces them down. 
and that's how it moves through the ground. Okay, I love this idea that um, you've got this manta ray like creature with uh, you know it's a mound shaped some you know circular shaped and the two wings do that sidewinder movement so they're not in constant contact with the hot sand love this idea uh we need an artist to draw that up and uh and add that to the frontier um through the magazine so if uh if if uh you're an artist and you're inspired to draw that you can submit it at uh at star frontiersman uh, at gmail.com. And uh, so it's star frontiersman, all lowercase, at gmail.com. <clears throat> and uh, I will see that that gets into the magazine and gets added to Frontier Lore because uh, that is a cool idea. It's a cool alien idea and it's a it's an original idea and I absolutely love that. So, um, you know, kudos to Kevin for coming up with this. That is absolutely fantastic. Across the sand and I came up with that as an idea I called it the Blarger and it was a... So that was the Blarger. Um, I'm assuming B-L-A-R-G-E-R, -E Blarger. Um, it's an awkward name, but... It's okay with me. Slow moving creature, but it could go for days without rest. And I thought, okay, yeah, maybe the locals in Lacco would be traveling across the sand dunes on their blargers. The locals themselves, I also thought, uh, put a little. So he's setting up a uh, almost a Bedouin, but maybe not a Bedouin, but uh, you know, like a nomadic uh, groups. These are people who are not going to benefit from the uh, educational system. So they, they, they might lack in some advanced skills, but, um, you know, they're going to uh, live off the land. They're going to live in the desert. They're going to, you know, probably have customs that uh, make them a little bit different. Um, and I like this idea. And, uh, you know, they live and travel with their Blarger, and, uh, and I almost see them setting up a shelter, and then they get the Blarger to, to you know, kind of crawl up over the top and be the roof, uh, which would then contraindicate ever having a fire inside to cook. So uh, I don't know how they adapt around that, but I like the idea of them living very closely with their Blarger um, and maybe even using it for shelter in combination with setting up walls and it comes in over so uh very interesting idea uh we want to get to the uh filter cloak piece thought into them i thought okay i want these people you know humans drow sites rusks etc i want them to be echoing some different kind of a worldly vibe and i thought well if you're living on a planet that's got all the sand kicking up into your face all the time you're probably going to use uh, thing to cover your head. Now, um, in Arab countries, they have a thing called the, and I'll just look it up here, the Shemag. Shema? Uh, anybody who's in the Arab world, let me know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. But it's that head dressing, that kind of uh, filtering out all the sand and the grit from your face as the winds kick up. I thought, right, I'm going to make something like that that everybody wears, and I'll call it the filter cloak. It'll be made of very thin material, and it, the, the locals tend to wrap it around themselves, definitely cover their faces, so that when the wind kicks up, you can... Okay. I love this idea, what he's proposing, this piece of new equipment. And uh, this filter cloak uh, that goes over your head and you can wrap it around your face. And I'm going to make, uh, we're going to let him finish here, and uh, I'm going to make one suggestion to modify the filter cloak that I think uh, even Kevin will embrace. Prepare yourself a little bit like Khan and his travelers or his followers. Yeah, kudos for him for mentioning Khan from Wrath of Khan. When Chekhov sees them outside the door, it's like, ooh, what is this? It's these sort of Bedouin creatures. No, these are the... the... So my modification to the filter cloak is it is a desert, water's an issue, and that it, it filters sand, but it also collects sweat. Now, it's... You know, it's not a completely encasing and, and, and prevents all loss of water like the, the, uh, the, the suits that they wore in Dune. 
but it does collect a lot of sweat. And so I thought that uh, it would collect a certain amount. And how you would determine that is you'd roll D100. Um, and, you know, that would be how many milliliters uh, you've collected of sweat that you could then add back into your, um, your water supplies, you know, in this survival situation of traveling in the desert. So I just thought that, you know, it's, it's not fantastic. It's not perfect. Um, it doesn't prevent all loss of water from sweat, but it does collect quite a bit. And I just thought that would be a great feature to add to this, you know, and, um, you know, I think what's the price of a gas mask in uh, Alpha Dawn? 30 credits. So say the filter cloak is 40, 45 maybe in that range. And, um, you know, it filters out dusk. It doesn't, it won't filter out gas. Like if somebody tosses a sleep grenade at you, but it will filter out the dust. It will, uh, you know, keep the dust out of your mouth and it will help collect sweat off of your head and your face um, and so on. And uh, save that water for you from just being lost in the environment. A lot of thought into this. If you're a human or a Yazarian or any hairy race, I thought to myself, you know, you wouldn't even bother having your hair made in any way. You wouldn't have braids, well maybe braids, but you wouldn't have your hair done in any way because the wind would just blow the heck out of it. So probably most hairy creatures like humans, Yazarians, etc. would all have like buzz cut. Now, he's making an interesting point here, and he's bringing in this piece of artwork, which I think uh, this piece of artwork were, um, was in one of the Beyond the Frontier modules, or it was in the uh, Dungeon Master screen, the little booklet that came with it. And it shows a Yazarian that has shaved his mane. We know the Yazarians have the mane. Now, now I wanted to comment on this um, because it ties into some thoughts I've had concerning the setting that... Um, the Yazarians are known for being warriors. So you've got this massive war going on. What are all the mercenary outfits like Galactic Task Force, Merc Co? They're going to try to recruit Yazarians because there's this consciousness in the society that Yazarians are, are warriors. And uh, so you're going to get traditional... Um, they're going to be going to the traditional Yazarian colonies and recruiting warriors. And this is a practical response to the environment, this whole shaving. So you're going to have these guys there. Some of them are on Laco for as much as 10 years. Uh, and they're going to have developed this habit of shaving. They go back to their traditional societies and people are going to be like, Oh my God, why are you shaving? They're going to, you know, it's going to be a reaction. So, these traditional societies, and I think mostly of um, Yast and Aethor, uh, the planet Yast and the Aethor system, uh, they're really going to hate the uh, corporate, uh, you know, they're really going to be against uh, young Yazarians leaving their clan and taking the corporate credit um, because this is the kind of thing that happens, and, uh, and they don't approve of this. But this is a very practical solution that the Yazarians who were in this battle, who were fighting in Laco's War, would maybe, you know, hit upon um, so that you expect them to have a mane. But you know, here's this guy. He's clearly shaved up like a human, and he's got a buzz cut. So there goes all his glorious hair. And when he goes home to his clan, they kind of freak out a little bit. And so you get this negative attitude, particularly amongst the more traditional clans and more traditional Yuzarian societies against um, the corporations, the megacorps, recruiting their young warriors to go and fight and take the, uh, the corporate credit, as they refer to it. So I like that. So um, I, I'm going to put the link for this video in the show notes. So these were like some very salient points I wanted to draw out of uh, this video. And I want to uh, bring up just in case you're thinking of um, doing a uh, Adventures on Laco, there are some resources, and I've collected them all into one little one-page document, and I will make this available. I will uh, put a link, and I will put it as a shared document off of the uh, Star Frontiers uh, Google Drive, and you'll be able to grab it um, 
And, uh, you know, so this is a collection of all the fan created information on LACO. So, uh, you know, you won't have to go searching for it. But uh, up here, this top table, you've got the Tetrarchs were written about by uh, C.J. Williams uh, in his article, uh, you know, talks about the mysteries of the Tetrarchs in Star Frontiersman number seven. You have a planetary brief by Richard Rose Shadow Shack, and it's got some really interesting stuff in there that I find intriguing. Uh, you know, so that is a Star Frontiersman 12. Uh, I just reviewed Star Frontiersman 20 in a fanzine Friday, and there are two articles in this particular fanzine uh, on LACO, just adventuring on LACO, two little short articles. And then um, Digging in the Dust of LACO in, in Frontier Explorer number two. That's written by me. That is quite extensive. We'll look at that. We'll just do a little bit, uh, a quick little review of that particular article. But uh, then you've got down here, I've compiled a list of every creature ever created um, <clears throat> by any fan in the fan magazines and set on Laco. Now, several of these were, you know, you see this digging in the dust of Laco. That's my article. So several of these were by me, but not all. Um, you've got uh, SF Men 19, Flora and Fauna of Laco. And SF Men uh, uh, 19 again here, another Flora and Fauna of uh, Mako, of Laco. So, you know, there's, there's other creations in here. Um, you know, and this is a nice list that gets you a, a little bit of a leg up on a, a monster manual for Laco. And then uh, there are three uh, flora that have been created. Um, the only one that, you know, th these were in the, um, well, I don't know about this one here, but this one here, this mansill is in, is a trade good and commodity. It's not something that's dangerous. It's just something that you might buy a shipment of it. If you're doing a commerce campaign with a freighter, you might pick up a shipment of this particular thing, you know, a ton of it, load it in the cargo container and take it with you, try to sell it elsewhere on the frontier. But uh, the dust spore that I created in digging in the dust of Laco has a danger and inherent danger. And then, um, this other one says, has such an involved name in SF Men 19. I think this might be a little bit more dangerous, um, but you can check those out. Now, this here is um, if you go to the FrontierExplorer.org website and you go into, uh, I will show you right here, Frontier Explorer Issues, you need to um, get to the second page to get access to issue number two. And you see here it says online and PDF. You don't even have to use grab the PDF. You can go to the online. This is back when we were actually putting every article as a separate web page online. And you can go right to, um, doo -doo -doo -doo, where is it? Digging in the Dust of Laco. And you can go right to this particular article. Uh, up here, I have reproduced all of the basic information that we had from the astrographic catalogs on um, on the planet Laco. You get a planet history. I've embellished it uh, quite a bit. And uh, one of my favorite illustrations that I drew uh, used to be called Kick a Draw. Uh, <laughs> this girl is doing a karate kick and caught this drawlocyte in the face and lifted him off his feet. I renamed it for this article, Jumped in the Streets of Laco. It's just one of my favorite uh, illustrations. Um, you get an environmental survey. I look at the very, I look at the various environments, uh, talk about the river canyons um, and uh, weather effects. It's a lot of this issues about water. It's, it's just borrowed right out of Crashed on Volturnus, where water's an issue in the game. Dust storms. I've incorporated some. Um, I've quantified some game effects that impact the characters for dust storms if they don't take precautions. And then the dust devils slash whirlwinds. And uh, I've used, uh, I've incorporated some effects for them. I thought these would be fun if um, particularly like if you had a combat erupt with something and a dust devil shows up. The dust devil basically uses the grenade bounce table to decide which direction it's going to go in. So you don't know what the dust devil is going to do, but it has effects that it can uh, bring about. And uh, I just thought this was good. Um, you know, and then I put a little note in here. The colonists speak of dust devils that have a mind of their own 
or uh, frequently turning up during combat. Some even talk of them being possessed. And an independent scientist alleged that they are uh, frequent, they're more frequent in the proximity of the Tetrarch ruins. Um, Pan Galactic Corporation adamantly denies this. Uh, it's hard to say what the truth actually is concerning the dust levels on Laco, as hard data, data is sadly lacking. And then we talk about the dust spore as an environmental problem that could impact the health of the player characters. Zoological survey, uh, I created a number of animals. Um, and I want to just jump down here to, you've got this Lycosian hound. I don't have illustrations for these, but this one here, the, the Lycosian Maui. This was inspired by, and let's just jump to this miniatures manufacturer. This is hassle-free miniatures out of England. I've been a fan of them for a long time. And this right here, this miniature is out of stock, but this um, a roaring Maui, Maui um, was what inspired me to create that. It has, there's no nostrils, there's no eyes, there's just a mouth. And it, I mean, just look at the aggression on that creature. And so this is what inspired me. And I, and I borrowed the name. I probably should have changed the name, but um, you know, if you were interested in grabbing an image, or even if you collected miniatures and you're interested in grabbing a miniature, um, you know, and I, I got one right here that needs to be put together. But since they did this, they have added to this collection. You've got three different ones, uh, Crouching and Leaping and the Roaring Maui. But you also have these lesser Mauis, Mauis um, and they're in all these different poses. And they don't quite look as vicious as the bigger brother um you know and so i actually just recently bought a pack of these and had them shipped from the uk they're kind of cool i need to get them based up and so you know this was what inspired me for that creature and that's where it came from so you can get an image for this and i would encourage hey those lesser maui look maui look pretty good flute flutterers these are the birds, the analog to birds. They have no legs, but four wings and then claws at, uh, you know, claws at the knuckle, the wing knuckle. Their wings are kind of constructed like a bat's, uh, you know, so the flute flutterer. And I specify here, there's 62 um, species of flute flutterer on Laco. And then I describe three of them here, the red muted sparrow, the muted red sparrow flute flutterer is a bred variety. This one no longer uh, does well in the wild. It is an actual bred variety used as a pet. Any of these can be tamed and used as a pet. There's rules for using them here. The, the flute hawk flutterer is dangerous. It actually has a sonic attack um, <clears throat> that it makes. And uh, so that's kind of cool. And, uh, you know, so, you know, you can have a pirate NPC walking around. He's got one of these, you know, flute hawk uh uh, flutterers on his shoulder and uh, you know it will attack whoever attacks its owner in combat you know in, in melee combat so uh, it's kind of cool places of interest and I wanted to specify here this Pangal City uh, secure corporate com uh, this Pangal City that I created it doesn't say it here but it should say it it has a starport Pangalactic full service starport, but only for Pangalactic ships. You come on down to uh, the battle ruins. This is where the Royal Guard of Clarion faced and defeated the entrenched Sathar. The Sa Sathar were looking to gain something from the Tetrarch ruins. And so they, they fought to the death to, to get to maintain control of those ruins. Um, once this battle happened, word about these ruins got out. And then people were like, oh, Ancient ruins with pyramids. This, you know, it suddenly made Laco a hot property and eventually led to the corporate war. Uh, ruins of base uh, Hedro. Hilo Hedro is the uh, CEO of Strill Corporation. So I thought they'd name a base after him. And I just thought it would be cool to have this ruined base out there, out in the desert somewhere. Um, you know, player characters might take shelter there during a sandstorm, that type of thing. The Inara Sea Nature Preserve is owned by Starplay through a subsidiary. Um, you know, they have uh, game hunts there, 
Point Glass is the capital, non-PGC capital of um, Laco. And I say in here, the starport is, um, it, the term starport is used loosely. Uh, in this case, it's a landing field with, um, with little more than pack dirt and mooring blocks. That statement should be someplace else. This place should have an adequate starport. Maybe not as nice as PGCs, but it is an adequate starport where you can get service and so on and so forth. Uh, Dave O's Bay, um, Moe's Easy in Devil's Basin. I was trying to create a, um, my working title was a Moe's Isley, you know, a wretched hive of scum and villainy. <laughs> Why? Because you got to have one, right? And so uh, the, the working title was Moe's Easy, uh, Moss Isley for a long time. And then I just made it Moe's Easy. Moe being a Drolocyte who, uh, veteran of the Lakos War, who built a bar almost in the middle of nowhere. And was, uh, so he, it, it's called the Easy. So it's Moe's Easy. And it's at the edge of Devil's Basin. So it's up on a plateau. And uh, Devil's Basin is where you find Tetrarch Ruins. You find the fire fountain, um, the, uh, you know, the, it's, you, you, you know, it enters into an area of, of deadliness and canyons and uh, places to explore where scientists will come to Mo's Easy. It's like the last stop before you're like on expedition, really. Uh, <clears throat> so it's uh, Devil's Basin. Uh, you get pirates hide out there sometimes. The uh, fire fountains, which are a, you know, it's like, it's like uh, Old Faithful at, uh, you, know, you know, our national park. Uh, <clears throat> you know, it says geyser that ignites on fire when it contacts air. So, and that's kind of a mystery. Why does it do that? They don't know. The scientists are still studying it. Um, Namoth Canyon is a mini Grand Canyon and the lowest dry spot on the surface of Laco. It's famed for the fire fountain, uh, flaming geyser, so on and so forth. Mysteries of Laco. So I wrote up, I just thought this planet needs to have mysteries. And uh, so we talk about the atmosphere. We talk about the frequency of dust devils. Um, the magnetic field fluctuations, which make compasses useless. Um, therefore, the locals have really learned to land navigate without the use of a compass. And during, uh, and Pan Galactic Corporation maintains satellites with GPS that you can use. But during Laco's war, that was one of the early targets that Streel took out. They took out all the satellites and they never got replaced till the war was settled. And then uh, Sathar stockpiles. There are persistent rumors of lost Sathar star, uh, stockpiles and artifacts. The Sathar occupied Laco during the first Sathar War, and much of their equipment was destroyed or collected by appropriate authorities. Rumors persist that there are lost caches of Sathar equipment, but everyone knows those are just rumors, dot, dot, dot. And then I see dead people. I worked in um, this thing... Uh, People, they, they, they found empty graves. People have reported seeing dead people walking. Um, it's all anecdotal evidence. Uh, the hypothesis is, is that because this is usually in connection with Tetrarch ruins, that uh, somebody opened something and nanites got out, got into these bodies and animated them. So it's a nanite animated uh, zombie type of thing. And I kind of play it off as, you know, no scientific explanation is evident. <clears throat> So you can just use it as a rumor, and it's not true, or you could actually do something with it for an adventure. And then uh, here I wrote uh, layovers at Laco. There are 15 different things that could happen. I should have actually wrote four more, and this could have been a 2D10 table. I don't know what I was thinking. Um, maybe I just couldn't come up with four more. But uh, this was a total brain fart on my part that I didn't write four more and make this a 2D10 table. And then, but I also did a sample catalog of Tetrarch artifacts. Now, I had taken an archaeology, an archaeology, intro to archaeology kind of class. One of the things they said in there was if, if archaeologists don't know what an artifact's purpose is, they say, they, they'll say it's ceremonial. <laughs> yeah, it's a great guess. I mean, it's like one of those default things. I don't know what it is. You know, I mean, a fork is obviously a fork, right? 
you know, a, a tool or an implement is obviously a tool. But when they don't know what it is or what its purpose was, they'll go ceremonial. So you see a lot of I was I was in love with that idea that we don't know what it is, so it's ceremonial. So you'll see hypothesized purposes ceremonial on a lot of these. And I wrote up 20 of them. I should have actually stopped at 19 and made this a 2D10 uh, table as well. But you could do 2D10 to roll for these. Just ignore number one, which is kind of boring anyways. Number one's kind of boring. So, um, you know, there you have it. Um, that is a, a more extensive article on LACO. I kind of went whole hog crazy, numerous creatures being uh, developed, the environment being described, a lot of places of interest. So I want to I want to thank um, Kevin for doing this video. Uh, his is uh, his YouTube channel is down the rabbit hole. He does a lot of pop culture stuff on video games, uh, other RPGs. You know, he's got a great channel. I love his channel. I'm, I am a subscriber to it. And uh, so, and I, you know, mostly I'm watching for the Star Frontiers content. And again, that's, that's my big complaint. Kevin, you don't do enough Star Frontiers content. That's my big complaint. But uh, there'll be a link in the show notes. There will be a link in the show notes as well for this uh, LACO document that I put together. You'll be able to download that. You'll have all of the uh, content on LACO that's available in any of the fan magazines. And uh, this is Tom for Star Frontiers Gamer. Again, I want to thank Kevin for a great video. I, I loved watching this video. And I want to thank you for watching. Thanks to my subscribers. You guys are great. Don't forget, this coming Friday, fan, uh, uh, Fanzine Friday, is going to be on Tabletop Tap Room. We're shutting down this channel. We're not going to run two. We're going to move all the Star Frontiers content back to Tabletop Tap Room. So don't forget, that's coming this Saturday, uh, of Friday, excuse me. So, uh, again, thank you, everyone, and I will see you in the frontier, maybe even on the planet Laco. So, a uh, special announcement. Uh, we've been working to get that homage artwork up, and I've created a store. The link will be in the show notes, the infamous show notes with the links. Um, there, <laughs> I mean, the links for everything, including... Um, you know, a link for Frontier Frontier Explorer number two. So <laughs> you'll be able to download everything from the links. But uh, we've uh, set up a Cafe Press store, and uh, we've set up some swag, including if you look uh, in this upper corner, it's my um, OSR Values Only Show Respect uh, logo. Uh, we've set that up as T-shirts and coffee cups uh, as well, just to promote – the whole idea that we want to control the narrative and not let the buffoons in the hobby who promote racism or hate uh, uh, control the narrative. And it's just so it's just uh, this uh, only show respect logo. I'm making it free. Um, it, the design was done for free by me uh, for me by uh, Don Samora at Wizard Tower Games. Shout out to Don. Dude, you're great. I love you. Um, so, uh, you know, that swag is there, but also the homage swag to the 40th anniversary of our favorite role-playing game is up there. So you can get a T-shirt. So this is the actually rejected artwork and is now uh, three characters on the, on the, uh, in the uh, artwork. Uh, male explorer, female explorer, and a little alien sidekick kind of dealio. And uh, it says on the cup, it says 40 light years from the frontier and still exploring. That's a reference to 40th anniversary, and uh, we've avoided any IP on this. I, I paid for this art, avoided any IP, um, and uh, so we put it out there because we know that people were looking for that um, 40th anniversary patch that Tom is not allowed to do. So there will be no official 40th anniversary patch, unfortunately, because... You know, I get it. TSR's dealing with the buffoonery. Um, so they've not given us permission to do that. Fine. We do an homage, and uh, we're putting it out there as a celebration of the 40th anniversary. Plus, it's kind of a cool way. You know, you'll see somebody at a convention, and you'll be like, hey, fellow frontiersmen. You know, and I think that'll be cool. So um, uh, check out the store. Link's going to be in the show in the show notes. 
And uh, again, thank you for your support. Thank you for your encouragement. You know, thank you, my fellow frontiersmen. Um, you know, we're doing this for you. Uh, we, we enjoy doing it. And uh, we hope you enjoy the content that we're producing as well. And I'll see you in the frontier. <laughs>